So uh, as we're hearing the voices of these kids head out, I'm going to begin with a story about some kids, actually. One little girl, her name is Crystal. She's about four years old. She's hanging out on the couch with her father one evening, to which she's um, just having small conversation like kids do, toddlers, you know, and a little bit older than a toddler. Um, and she says to her dad, she says, Daddy, Daddy, you're the, you're the boss of the house, right? To which Daddy says, oh, yeah, yeah, Crystal, I'm the boss of the house. And um, then she says, well, Daddy, you're the boss of the house because Mommy appointed you to be the boss of the house, right? <laughs> now, isn't that funny? You're all laughing. Um, and uh, why is it that we're laughing? Well, there's a couple reasons why, probably, but one of them is uh, just the reality that you like to be the boss, right? We, as people, we like to be the boss. You ask a uh, high school student who um, finally graduates and moves out and is on his own, or maybe she goes head off to college, and you ask them, what's the best part about living on your own? And they'll say, I get to be the boss of me, right? I get to plan my schedule. I get to get up when I want to get up, go to bed when I want to go, go to bed. I get to go do whatever it is I want to do. I get to be the boss of me. And as people, we like to be the boss of me. But probably a deeper reason why we laughed at that is that there's this male-female thing going on, right? There's this daddy-mommy thing. And uh, within that, there's this sense of who really is in charge in the family unit. Is it the mom or is it the dad? And because we all want to be the boss, and, you know, so and we're men and we're women, and we, you know, hey, if mom's in charge, that feels pretty good. If dad's in charge, it feels pretty good. And so we laugh at that. But then maybe even deeper underneath that is this thing, this cultural thing, this reality that historically there has been this um, view of women in which women are less than men. And so we chuckle at that because here, little Crystal, she says, hey, mommy, or hey, hey daddy, mommy put you in charge, right? Like, uh, which goes counterculture to what history has been. And then as we look at modern culture, that's kind of the, the, that issue in many ways in modern culture has been settled. And so it feels kind of good inside of us. And so we chuckle at this, at this, little, this little story. Now, um, what is interesting is that it is true when we look historically at the issue of the role of men and women, uh, that women have been oppressed, have been put down. Take, for example, Roman culture. Back um, several hundred years before Christ, you have Aristotle, and you also have the Jews. And so here's a quote from the Jewish Talmud, which this rabbi, in writing the Jewish Talmud, says this about the Torah. He says, the words of the Torah, the Torah would be the, the Old Testament, should be burned rather than entrusted to women. So this is the perspective of a Jewish rabbi, a Jewish teacher, a Jewish leader, 300 AD. It's better to burn the Bible than to teach women. Um, Aristotle, a greco um, Roman, uh, more, more a, a Grecian philosopher, um, says these words in the history of animals about women. He says, wherefore women are more compassionate and more readily made to weep, more jealous and quarrelous, fonder of railing and more contentious. The female is also more subject to depression of spirits and despair than the male. She's also more shameless and false, more readily deceived, more mindful of injury, more watchful, more idle, and on the whole, less excitable than the male. Aristotle does not have a high view of women. It leads him to say uh, this as well. He says, the male is by nature more expert at leading than the female. The relation of male to female is by nature a relation of superior to inferior and ruler 
too ruled. Now, this mindset, um, you know, I, I, I didn't really need probably to go through all of these quotes because we know today in modern history and particular modern Americans, that this has been the mentality of people, the behavior of men throughout the centuries. And we also know that because as Americans, we has a, as a society have navigated this response and have come out on a very different perspective, right? And so um, the formation of the United States eventually uh, we moved as a country to the place in which we said that is appropriate, not only appropriate, but it is righteous. It's right that women should be able to vote. And so the 19th Amendment was crafted in the 19, what, 1920s, um, and so women have the right to vote. And then as we enter into the 1950s and 60s, women have the right to be educated alongside of men in all of our institutions. They have the right and the expectation to be able to work in the workforce and to do any job that any male does and to be paid fairly and equally for it, right? And so today you can find women who are working in all the same professions that men are working in and they can rise to the highest levels in those industries and those companies, right? And so we even have within the United States women who serve as Supreme Court justices Currently, a woman who is the vice president of the United States, and of course, a woman could serve as the president of the United States. And so as an American culture, and we're all Americans sitting here, we've come to conclusion on this issue. Men and women are equal. And yet there's this conversation within the church about the role of men and women. Now everybody's listening. Hmm, where are we going with this? Well, here's where we're going with that. We're in this series, working through the book of 1 Timothy. It's a series on, we, we've called, uh, you know, um, a perspective, a biblical perspective on leadership. We've said that 1 Timothy is not a book about leadership. 1 Timothy was not written by Paul to Timothy to describe leadership principles and leadership values and the ways to lead. But instead, we said that 1 Timothy is a book that says, provide leadership. Provide leadership. Timothy, you need to provide leadership. And what we're going to uncover today is that Paul addresses the topic of women in leadership. And when we read it, it creates all kinds of questions as a modern American reader. Because where we are as a culture in what Paul says seems to clash. And so how are we to understand that? And that's the big, the big um, the, uh, issue that we're, that we're after today. And so um, I invite you, if you have a Bible, to... Turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I will again remind us and encourage us to uh, be reading through 1 Timothy throughout the week. If you just read one chapter a day, taking maybe five to eight minutes to get through just one chapter a day, by the end of the week you'll have read the whole book of 1 Timothy. Go back and read it again. If you've taken that challenge, you've been through the book now at least three times. And you're probably your fourth time through reading the book of 1 Timothy. And because you've been reading it repeatedly, you know what 1 Timothy chapter 1 is about, about major, two major ideas. You probably have read 1 Timothy 2 and have been waiting for this message to talk about this because you've had a lot of questions. Some of you may have already dug into some of those questions and begun to do some research. But I encourage you to keep reading through 1 Timothy. Again, our vision is to be internally strong. And to be internally strong, you need to know Jesus and his word. And so that's why we encourage you this. This is how you know Jesus and his word. Spend time reading it. So here we go. First Timothy chapter 2. Paul says this in verse 8. He says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer. 
without anger or disputing. Now, just before we go to the next verses, just really quickly, um, this is a posture, a common posture of Jewish men in prayer would be to lift up their hands before God. It's a, it's a, it's a way to physically, bodily express a humble attitude and, a, and an attitude that says, God, I, I need you and I'm waiting for you to do something in my life. I'm here with palms open wide. I need you to do something for me. It's a humble attitude before God. And then he says um, to do this with a pure heart, right? There's a, there's a sense of purity in this without anger or disputing. It's, it's to come before God humble and pure, humble and righteous. The anger and disputing likely is connected to the false teaching that runs through the book in Paul's admonition to Timothy to deal with the false teaching. So people may have been in a worship service, something was said, and people get angry. Paul says that can't happen. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands. And no, it's Paul saying this. I want, this is interesting, pay attention to that I throughout this, the, the rest of the text. And so here we go now in verse 9. Paul says, I also want women. So now he addresses men, now he addresses women. I want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety without braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Now there's a bunch of husbands who are like, yeah, I like that. Maybe some moms and dads were like, yeah, I like that, as my young daughter likes to shop. Hey, define expensive. I mean, I suppose that all of us are dressed in expensive clothes in comparison to our brothers and sisters living in a Ghana in the slum. By the way, thanks to all, all of you who were present at the Arm of Hope banquet um, this past Friday, and those of you who are contributing, giving to that vision to minister and to help children living in a slum community. I suppose all of us have expensive clothes in comparison to them. Maybe some of us would say, well, you know, I, you know, I, I, shop, at, I shop at Walmart, so that's not very expensive clothing. Or some of you are saying, well, I, maybe a little step above that. I shop at Kohl's or JCPenney's, and, and my jeans aren't that expensive. They're maybe 40 bucks. Um, but then, you know, maybe the expensive jeans you're going to find at Lord & Taylor or Macy's or Nordstrom or maybe another high, you know, you're paying 500 bucks. Paul says women are not supposed to have braided hair, gold, pearls, or expensive clothes. But instead, they're supposed to dress with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman... Interesting, it highlights a woman. A woman should learn in quietness. Shh. Full submission. Hmm. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have any kind of authority over a man. She must be silent. And then he goes on this very interesting illustration or attempt to defend his point by saying, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, you read a text like this, and, and you read it in today, and we're all sitting here today in 2023, and you go, that sounds incredibly misogynistic, right? That sounds like women are prejudiced against in a, in a huge way. Paul singles out, so it seems, women as though the way that they dress has got to be different than the way that men dress. Doesn't say anything about men wearing expensive clothing. We don't get any women here being able to go, yeah, and my husband who spends all of this money on that stuff? Nothing, nothing, nothing there about men spending a ton of money, dressing 
fancy, wearing fancy things. We have women who are supposed to be quiet and silent, and they're not permitted to teach or to have authority. they got to remain silent. It seems as though the last part he's emphasizing, women should stay at home, produce children, because somehow being at home, having children after children, bearing children, somehow makes me in a better standing with God. And so the first reading of this text creates angst. Now, two Sundays ago, I was uh, standing in Stuttgart, Germany, on top of a mountain at the ruins of a castle. I was there because a family friend was married. And um, there's a bunch of Germans. I mean, most of them are Germans. Fortunately, most people spoke English, and I could interact with them. I found myself uh, during the reception interacting with a young man by the name of Luca. And I don't think Luca is a follower of Jesus. And actually, he had questions. This is part of what it looks like to be externally focused, by the way. It's just like, you know, you're living life with people, and the way that you are interacting with them, you, 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 you find ways to talk about things that point to Jesus. And so we're having this conversation, and actually we're talking about organizational leadership. It's what he does professionally, studies organizational leadership. He works for a company. I'm like, wow, that's fascinating. I love organizational leadership. My doctoral work, I, I did a ton of reading on that. And so we're, we're engaging in this very interesting conversation. And, and then eventually, somehow, he asked this question about church and in particular about the Bible. And he says something like, I don't know how you can, can believe the Bible, how you can follow the Bible. Because the Bible talks about women in a, such a negative way. Women, they can't do this and that and all these kinds of things. And, and yet modern culture, I mean, good grief, we've got a president, you know, the president of our country. She's a woman. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you believe the Bible? How do you all the Bible would teach is this archaic stuff. You may be here this morning, and you may be one of those persons where you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and that's great, or you're viewing online the service in the middle of the week or whatever. And we're glad that you're with us and asking those questions. I encourage you to keep asking those questions. And so that's a big question to, to answer while you're eating pastries in the middle of a German culture. And so I began, I said, Luca, you know, um, th this is a huge, this is a huge conversation. And, and there's a lot of things that we need to talk about. First of all, I want you to know that I do believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God. I believe that God gave us the Bible. That's a big conversation to talk about that. But, but rather than talk about all that, let's talk about two other things. And um, one of them is this. You know, this, this conversation that we're having is, um, is a, a conversation that really has been happening in the church for a long time. And, and in fact, the interpretation and the application of this text has been debated for thousands of years. So you can go back to the church fathers, early church believers. So these guys, um, we're going to look at here, a couple quotes from, these guys have basically one, maybe two generations removed from the apostles. And Tertullian, this is his view. This is what Tertullian writes. He says, you're the devil, referring to women. You're the devil's gateway. You are the unsealer of that tree. Sound like what Paul, he's refer referencing what Paul says here at the end of, uh, uh, of the verse, in verse 14 and 15. You are the first forsaker of the divine law. You are the one who persuaded him whom the devil was not brave enough to approach. Tertullian's view of women is a low view of women. Now, at the same time, you have another church father, Clement of Alexandria. And he is talking about the apostles. Paul, is, of whom is one of the apostles who, who writes this in 1 Timothy. And he, he's talking about how these apostles have women who travel with them, traveled with them, in the communication, in the proclamation, in the teaching of the gospel. And he says uh, of these women that they might be their fellow ministers in dealing with housewives. It was, though, it was through them that the Lord's teaching penetrated also the women's quarters without any scandal being aroused. 
Clement has a high view of women. He says that the, the apostles had these women go with them. They were, they were co-laborers. They worked together with the men in communicating the gospel. There's a guy who comes about 100 years after. His name is Jerome. And uh, Jerome says uh, that these people, in reference to people who were criti- being critical of him because he, um, he uh, in the, the beginning of one of his books, commemorated or dedicated it to women who were students of his. He was teaching women. So he had these critics who were critical of him. He writes, these people do not know why um, that while Barak trembled, Deborah saved Israel, the, that Esther delivered from supreme peril the children of God. Is it not to women that our Lord appeared after his resurrection? Yes, and the men could then blush for not having sought what the women had found. High view of women. He goes on, um, uh, ch- church history, women in early, early church. Mike, go to the next slide, please. Um, talks about f- further uh, of, of Jerome's work. He says, in, in the 300s, women seized upon the opportunity to study the Bible, Hebrew, and Greek. The circle of Roman women who studied with Jerome in the late 300s uh, showed such scholarship that he thought nothing of referring some church elders to Marcella for the resolution of hermeneutical problems. So Jerome is saying, hey, uh, you guys, you elders, you leaders of a church, you're, you're struggling to interpret a passage of scripture. You should talk to this lady because she's been such an incredible student of God's word. Again, this is 300s. So, so, mu- so much so that 100 years later, you have Augustine who could declare that any old Christian woman was better educated in spiritual matters than any philosopher. So an older woman who was a believer was viewed as being more educated in spiritual matters than an educated male philosopher of his day. So this is interesting. So, so um, you have this debate, we could say, that's been going on in early church history within 100, 200, 300 years of the apostles, within 100, 200, 300 years of Paul writing this, and you see the church fathers wrestling and debating and having different opinions on the role of women. So we have to understand that. Just that historically, this has been a conversation, and it continues to be a conversation in the church today. And, um, and, and maybe like even right up to, to, to the moment today, uh, you, you, would be, uh, you could classify the arguments as egalitarian or complementarian, for those of you who want to study that and get into it. Egalitarian, women can and should be equal to do any and everything in the life of a church that a man does. Complementarian, women can and do and should use their gifts in complement to men. And there's a whole, there's a ton of stuff modern day written about this. But this, So this is the debate continuing today. Secondly, I, I said to Luke, I said, um, not only do you have to understand there's this big debate that's been going on, but secondly, you must understand that a good hermeneutic is essential for good application. A good hermeneutic is essential for good application. Then I had to explain what hermeneutic is. That's just a big, it's a big theological word to talk about the science of interpretation, and there's lots of fields that, that study hermeneutics, or the, they, they utilize hermeneutics. It's, hermeneutics is simply a process in which a, a person uses a series of principles that a person follows as they attempt to discern the original intent of the, of the person writing or speaking. That's hermeneutics. So for us to accurately and correctly understand what Paul is saying here to the church of Ephesus, when he's talking to Timothy and saying all of these things about women, we must have a good hermeneutic to make sure we have a good application. Now, by good hermeneutic, let me um, just begin by just giving us two hermeneutical principles. There's, there's, there's several hermeneutical principles. I can't get into all of them, but just two. Number one, the first one, to interpret scripture within the context of the whole of scripture. Whenever you interpret scripture, whatever it says in one place, you must understand that what it's saying in that one place needs to be understood in the context of all. 
because the Bible is a whole. It's one book. It's one book. It's one message. Yet there's 66 books that make up this one book that we call the Bible. And what a writer writes in Revelation with the Spirit of God inspires John to write in Revelation will not and does not contradict what God inspires Moses to write when he writes in Genesis. And what David is inspired to write in Psalms does not contradict what Peter is inspired to write in First and Second Peter. So what you find in any book, you must understand it in the context of the whole of Scripture. So when you apply this principle to interpret Scripture within the context of the whole of Scripture, related to the question of what is the role of women, what is the biblical role of women, how should we understand women, how should we understand what Paul says here about women, you need to do it in the context of the whole. And so really quickly, here's the context of the whole, and just a, a smattering from the Old Testament, and then I'll give you a smattering from the New Testament. When you look at women in the Old Testament, you'll see, for example, in Exodus 15, Miriam, the sister of Aaron and Moses, who prophesies. She prophesies. She speaks the word of God over the nation of Israel, predicting into the future. You have Deborah, Deborah, a woman who leads the entire nation. She's put in the position of having authority over men, making decisions for the entire nation of Israel. You have Esther, Esther who gave her life. She didn't die, but she put herself in a, in a risky place. She's a significant leader in the nation of Israel. You have Huldah, fascinating, very little written about her, but she's a prophetess. And the king and the high priest came to her to understand, help us to understand, they said, what the law means here. So they're asking a woman to give them an interpretation of the law. This is Old Testament. I'm moving into the New Testament. Next slide. And in the New Testament, we encounter right away um, Anna, who's a prophetess living at the time of the birth of Christ. And she prophesies, again, Get, receiving a word from God, speaking into the future about things. Then we encounter Jonah, uh, Joanna, Mary, and Martha, who are financial supporters. They were followers of Jesus. We follow, we, 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 um, as you follow the Gospels, you, you see Jesus' interaction with women, which stands in stark contrast to the culture of the day, which oppressed women, saw women as less than men. Jesus elevated women. He, was, he associated with them. They followed him. He taught them. In Greco-Roman world, women were not allowed to discuss publicly with men. And here Jesus is sitting with women publicly and talking and interacting with them. We find Dorcas in Acts, who's renowned for her care for the poor, so she's using her gifts to serve a and, and, and to lead the church in caring. Find Lydia, a successful businesswoman, a supporter for Paul. We find Priscilla and her husband Aquila, who end up being teachers of Apollos. Apollos, who in 1 Corinthians, there's a big debate. Who's more important, the Apostle Paul or Apollos? In here, Priscilla taught Apollos. We have Nympha, who hosted a church in her home. Phoebe, a deacon in the church in uh, uh, Centrea. You have Yodia and Syntyche who contended at Paul's side in proclaiming the good news. And that's, a, that's an interesting phrase, which means to wrestle alongside with. It's a term used in the, in the games to fight and to, to work together to, to be successful in the games. Here, Paul refers to Yodia and Syntyche as women who are working together with him in proclaiming the gospel. That word proclaim is often translated as preaching. Preaching the gospel. Paul says these women preached the gospel with me. You have Paul, who makes an argument in Galatians 3.28, says there's neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. So we have Paul himself saying men and women ought to be understood and viewed as equal in God's mind. There is no male, there is no female. So all of this leads me to write this in conclusion. When we interpret 1 Timothy 2 within the context of the whole of Scripture, 
we see something more than just like this first quick reading of what Paul is saying in 1 Timothy 2. We find women who prophesy. We find women who lead, judge, make decisions, and have authority over men. We find women who teach the king, the priest, and Apollos, women whom Jesus recognizes, values, teaches, and even gives responsibility to. Whatever Paul means in 1 Timothy 2, he does not mean it in contradiction to all these other texts. He can't. The Spirit of God does not write one thing in one place that's in contradiction to everything else that he says in other places. So then what do we do with this? Well, it leads to the second hermeneutical principle, and that is to interpret Scripture within its cultural, social, and historical context or setting. So a good hermeneutic says, okay, what is the writer saying to the people that he's writing to? What does it mean directly to them? And when we consider that, there's a couple things that we understand and know about women in the church of Ephesus because we can understand and know what the church of Ephesus is like living in the city of Ephesus in 60 A.D., when Paul is writing to people living in 60 AD. And women in the church of Ephesus looked like this. First of all, there were converted Jewish women who would have been part of this church, highly likely. Because we would find that Paul goes into the synagogue, he preaches the gospel at whatever city he goes, and there are Jews and there are Jews who respond to the gospel. It's highly likely to conclude that many of those women would have been Jewish women who are responding to the gospel. And in their response to the gospel, from their cultural context, again, remembering their cultural context, is that women cannot learn. Women are not permitted to learn. Burn the Talmud. Now, that does come a couple hundred years later, but it is the flavor and the feel of the modern Jewish rabbi. Women must not learn. But here, these Jewish women are being told that they can learn. And now in this newfound freedom in Christ, perhaps what is happening is some of them are just running head into some of this and creating controversy and conflict because they found this newfound freedom to, to learn and to express. That could be part of what's going on. Secondly, going on in the, 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 the city of Ephesus is this, um, well, the whole city, the, the, there's the, the goddess of Artemis. And uh, the, the, this goddess is the fertility god. And we have ruins. It's all the ruins of this amazing structure. Uh, you can read in Acts uh, 17, 18, 19, where Paul gets into trouble in the city of Ephesus, and there's a reference to this, this goddess and, and um, uh, the silversmith thing, and this is how the church actually gets birthed because, uh, anyways, this is another story. Uh, but uh, uh, so the, the women, there were women who served in the temple as prostitutes because this is the fertility god. And so it's highly likely to conclude that there's a number of women who are coming to faith out of that lifestyle, who dressed in particular ways, behaved in particular ways. And Paul is saying, look, expensive clothes, decking yourself out like this, going to work to turn in the eye of a man. This is completely inappropriate. You're now a follower of Jesus. You must dress modestly. Get rid of all of this expensive clothing, all this stuff that, that you did in worship, supposedly to the goddess of Artemis. So it could be that that's what Paul is addressing. Another cultural situation with, with women, um, it, we know from the First Timothy, um, what Paul is writing in other places in, in the book and in, in Second Timothy, that some of these women who are converts are, are widows and they're weak, weak, weak women and they're getting taken advantage of by the false teaching. So, uh, so some of these women 
are, are being led astray, and, and, and Paul, we're going we're to see this in 1 Timothy 5 too, that some of the behavior of some of these women, he calls, he, Paul actually calls out in 1 Timothy 5, that they're, they're wandering around, they're going from house to house, and they're idle, and they're, they're, they're gossiping, and they're spreading rumors, and they're behaving in all kinds of inappropriate ways, and Timothy, you've got to address that, you've got to stop that. And perhaps, perhaps, Paul is speaking in this text directly about those women, who are coming into a public worship setting, creating all kinds of chaos because, because of their situation in life and they need to be restrained, they need to be contained, they need to be taught this is the right way. And after all, re- learning for anybody, male or female, in submissiveness and silence is the appropriate way to learn rather than with closed mind, closed ears, and being argumentative about your point whether you're a man or a woman, right? And so if we're going to read 1 Timothy chapter 2 with a good hermeneutic, we must understand just those two basic principles. So then, of course, this then leads to, well, how do you apply this? And what I'm about to say, it doesn't matter what I say, some of you aren't going to like it. You're going to disagree. Um, And that's okay. And this is what we need to understand is that we're sitting here, and not only us, But within the bigger church, there's all kinds of opinions on this. I already mentioned this earlier. And it doesn't matter what we say. We're going to argue and disagree because we're going to struggle to correctly interpret and to apply what it is that that we're interpreting. But to help you and to help make this a little more dicey, uh, let me just give you a smattering of questions. For you to attempt to try and say, okay, what does this mean? Let's apply it to today. And so here's a series of questions. What can a woman do in a church? Can a woman teach Bible or theology in a theological seminary or Bible college? Yes or no? Can she teach Bible at a nationwide denominational meeting? We're about to gather together at the Evangelical Free Church right down the road in Lancaster, uh, the EFC East, and we're going to be together for a conference. Is it appropriate for a woman to speak at that conference and to open the Bible? Is it appropriate for a woman to teach or preach the Bible regularly in a worship service on Sunday morning, to stand here and to teach? Is it appropriate for her to do it maybe occasionally? Is it appropriate for a woman to stand here on this stage and to lead us in worship? Is it appropriate for her to teach in an adult class, to teach in a study at somebody's home, to teach college students, to teach high school age? So if you're saying no at one, maybe you say yes at two. And on and on. This is how the progression goes. Is it okay for a woman to write a book on Bible doctrines? Is it okay for her to edit a book? Is it okay for her to write a commentary? Is it okay for her to write study notes? Is it okay for her to edit a Bible intended primarily for women? Is it okay for her to teach the Bible to a woman's class? If you don't permit it to teach, maybe it's she's permitted to teach women. Even though Paul doesn't say that in the text. He just says, I don't permit a woman to teach. But, but maybe because... Is she, can she teach a woman's class or a group? Can she teach maybe the junior high class? Because, because after all, junior high, they're, they're, they're younger boys than high school boys. Is that okay? Is she, can she teach as a Bible professor on a secular campus, Etown College? Can she teach Bible there? Can she teach evangelistically to a large college campus ministry? Can she, can she go to disciple makers and speak there to uh, men and women who are not believers? Can she work as an evangelist, as a missionary in another country? Can she read scripture? Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe that's all she can do. She can read scripture on a Sunday morning during worship right, right, right here. Ryland read it this morning. Maybe. It, can, can a woman do that? Can she give a personal testimony in front of the entire church body? Is that okay for a woman to speak when we gather together in that way? Is it okay for her to participate in a discussion in a home Bible study? To teach children Sunday school? To even sing while we're gathered for worship? I mean, if a woman is to remain silent, is it okay for her to sing? See, if we put this all up there to go, wow, this is not easy, is it? You might draw your line, you know, it's really easy. You read the text like, oh, this is really easy, women can't do. And now all of a sudden you're faced with, wow, I think she can do that, but she can't do that. And then we, ask, then we got to ask this question, well, why do you think she can do this and she can't do that? It gets really complicated, doesn't it? It's not so quick and easy and snap your fingers and, wow, this is the way that it goes. Well, as leaders of the church, the elders have had to work to come to some kind of conclusion on this topic. And so I'm going to just read to you the final paragraph from 
our document that you see called Gender Roles and Leadership, and this is available to anybody who would like it. Um, just ask, and, and we'll get it for you. There's actually a whole bunch of people right now who are in the About Hope class and pursuing membership, and it's in, our, it's in, in, in that manual. But this is what we write. It is our conclusion that the church is to give men and women abundant opportunities to use their gifts in leading, teaching, edification, encouragement, consolation, conviction, and guidance in any setting of the church body for the furtherance of the good news, the gospel. With exception to an elder, and I didn't even get into that conversation, we're going to talk about that next week, the role of elders in the life of the church. With exception to an elder position in the church, women should not be impeded from any role in ministry and should be encouraged to fully explore and express her giftedness and passions. But both male and female must do this under the direction of the male eldership leadership of the church as their gifts are identified and they are invited into these roles by elder oversight of all shepherding and teaching roles within the body. And I'm going to invite our worship team to come on up. And as they're coming, let me just say this, um, by way of application. Uh, most of us have come to whatever conclusion that we have. If we're honest, most of us come to whatever conclusion we've had because you heard somebody in your local church setting at some time, like me, a pastor, somebody teach and say something. And so you're like, that, that made sense. And so you think, okay, so that's my position. If we're really honest, most of us haven't really dug into this, which Digging into it requires a lot of time and energy. And we should dig into it. After all, the Apostle Paul commended the Bereans because they went home and they double-checked what it was that he taught them to make sure that what they were teaching was in alignment. So we all need to kind of dig into this and study it. And then lastly, we should hold our position humbly, not with an argumentative spirit, not with arrogance, as though we have it all figured out. We need to respect each other because this is not easy to wrestle through what Paul intends and means here. But certainly whatever he means, it's not in contradiction to all of Scripture and it is related to the historical context in which he writes. Now, we're going to move into a time of communion for the next few minutes. And uh, as we do, I'm going to invite you to think about your attitude as a woman. Speaking just the women. What is your attitude towards men? You may have been in an environment that has oppressed you and put you down and you've been mistreated. And you've been sinned against and you've been harmed. And you're harboring that bitterness. Perhaps God is calling you today to release that, to let that go. To say, I forgive the men in my life who harmed me. To those of you who are men, let me challenge you. Let me ask you, is, have you behaved in such a way towards women that you've demeaned them, that you've put them down, that you've treated them as inferior, not as a sister in Christ, not as a mother in Christ, not as one who, as Paul says, is equal. There's neither male nor female in Christ. And there's something there that you need to confess. Let's get this right as a church. Let's get this right. The society needs a group of people who live counterculture, men who respect women, men who elevate women, and women who respect men and treat them with honor and respect rather than people who are tearing each other down constantly. And we can do that. We can live like that in the places that we work. We can live like that in this community and bring a different perspective, Jesus' perspective, and men and women. There's bread and there's juice up front. I invite you to come and take the bread, take the juice, take it back to your seat. Reflect on these things. Ask God for the forgiveness that you need and then we'll receive it together.
communion is such a wonderful time. It's, just a, rem- it's a time for us to remember that we can't do it. it. Reminds us that we mess up continuously, but we have a Savior who took our sin. That's what Jesus did. He took your sin. He took my sin. We need the gospel. We need it every single day of our life because nobody's perfect. Even when we're in Christ, we still fall short. So the bread you hold in your hand reminds you of that. The good news that Jesus forgives you of your sin when you just ask him to forgive. He paid the penalty. He made it possible. He made it possible for us to be right before God. Let's give thanks. Jesus said to his disciples, said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. So let's eat it together. And they took the cup off the table. He said, this is my blood shed for remission of your sins. Drink you all of it. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for forgiving us. We worship you. We give thanks. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Stand with us and declare that Jesus is risen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, no place to be. Your love made a way to their mercy come.
on, just a reminder, we're gathering for the picnic, Castle Farm. And then secondly, we want to welcome Sam and Taylor Hunter, who our new director of youth and young adults. We're so glad that you guys are with us. Sam will get started like next Monday, so this is not official work day. But if you want to say hi to him, you find them right over here. Say hi to them. They'll be out at the picnic as well. So uh, we're so glad to have you guys here. Have a great week, Hoke.